Good morning. I uh, would love to have dinner for two at Chicano's, but I, I didn't um, buy a raffle ticket, so uh, that kind of makes it hard for me to win. But anyway, um, it sounds like a, a lot of fun uh, this afternoon and, and the things that we can win. And, and our, um, uh, several of our high schoolers are heading to San Francisco next week, and they'll be down there for a week, and it's going to be a, just a great time. Uh, we're going to take them down there to serve the homeless and, and uh, in one of the most dangerous, uh, yeah, parents, right, uh, most dangerous parts of the city. Did I say dangerous? Uh, the, the nicest part of the city where there's a lot of homeless. Yeah, there we go. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you for coming this morning. If you are with us for the first time, I just want to say thanks again for, for coming to take a, a chance with us and, and check us out. We hope that you really enjoy it, and we really want you to know that wherever you are at on your journey, you are welcome here. Whatever you believe, wherever you're going, wherever you're headed, um, we're glad that you're here, and we really hope that you continue to join us and, uh, and become part of us. There's a lot of great people here, um, so, uh, and we are on a journey together, um, and we're excited about that. Uh, and if I have not met you, I would love to meet you today before you leave, so um, please make sure uh, we do that. Well, this morning we continue with part five in our series called I Gotta Know. I gotta know. And next week we'll finish off the series uh, with part six. But the focus of the series is getting to know God. I gotta know. I gotta know who he is and what he is like. And if you're a Christ follower, follower as you've uh, been listening over the last few weeks, if you're a Christ follower, if you're one who believes in God, I would think that getting to know the one that you believe in, uh, the one that you've chosen to follow, is pretty important, Right? Would you say that? That, that it is, okay? Uh, I mean, who is he? What is he like? And if I've chosen to follow him, well, it's probably a good idea for me to get to know him and find out where he's leading me. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, you know, Christ follower means you're following, you're going somewhere. And so it makes sense to figure out who this guy is, who God is, who Jesus is, and, and where he's, he's leading me. If you're a spiritually curious person here, and, and you're not sure if God exists, or maybe you do believe that he, get, he exists, and, and, uh, but you don't really know him, uh, you know who he is, what is he like, and so forth, how he may interact with you, that's the gist of this series, and, 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 I, and I hope that, that what we talk about today and over the last few weeks and next week will um, make sense, will help you to get to know God better, and um, Last week, we took a look at uh, God as the great shepherd in terms of one of the ways that he wants to relate to us and us to him. And, and if, you were, if you missed it last week, you can go online to our website and, and you can uh, watch the video or you can download the podcast, whatever it is, and, and listen because the, the, the stuff that we talked about last week is so important in, in how we interact with him and what that means to us on a daily basis. And so I just really encourage you to go online and listen to that. Uh, well, the title of the talk this morning is Holy. Now, depending on who you are and what your experience is, the word holy can bring about all kinds of different thoughts, all kinds of different ideas or even emotions into your mind, depending on your experience and who you are and so forth. And, and with the way our culture uses words today, context means everything, all right? It really does. How many of us have used the word holy as slang? Any one of us? A few of us are being honest. Come on. Don't be lying in church, all right? Um, you know, holy moly, holy smokes, holy cow, Batman, right? Holy mackerel, holy Toledo. I don't know why Toledo is holy. Why not say holy Boise or something, right? I don't know. Um, holy Moses, holy Mary, mother of God, right? You know, we all heard those things. Uh, Robin on Batman once said, holy haberdashery, Batman. I don't know what in the world that means, but uh, he said that. And then, of course, we get to more colorful uh, examples of holy, you know, variations of poop, right? All right? So anyway... <laughs> But obviously, none of those things that we just mentioned are really holy. Uh, you could maybe argue Moses or Mary, the mother of God, or something, but it's just another, another way of saying, wow, okay? That's, that's those slang things. In fact, here are a couple of pictures that would cause anyone to say, holy guacamole, all right? So look at that. How would you like that for your commute in the morning? Uh, holy moly. Or that being on one of your, your commutes, okay? Holy guacamole. All right, next one. Uh, good thing you're not a mountain goat. Holy cow, or goat, or whatever, okay? And there's the holy cow, all right. So uh, anyway, so we have, 
you know, slang versions of holy. And then we also have the religious versions of holy, right? There's a holy cross or a holy crucifix, the holy Bible, holy water, holy communion, holy matrimony, holy trinity, holy relics, holy ghost, and of course, the holy grail, right? And if you've seen anything, anyway, holy grail. So, but then of course we have the word holy in probably every other hymn or Christian song that there is. It mentions the word holy in the worship, just like we sang today with that lost song, Great I Am. And and so we sing the word holy in, in reference to God because it sounds nice or fitting of God, even though we may not really know what it means. You know, or, hallelujah, holy, holy. Uh, it sounds better when I play the bass, but anyway, you know, and uh, you get the idea. And, and we're singing that and we're like, yeah, you know, that sounds really good. I think I know what it means, but it sounds right, you know, and, and whatever pictures we have in our mind. Um, and then speaking of church and religion and, and so forth, the word holy often turns people off. It really can. Because when they hear the word holy, it's either, either irrelevant to their lives or they think of, themselves, or think of something or somewhere, maybe that's, that's somber or boring or full of candles and stained glass and robes and other things you're not supposed to touch, right? And you're thinking, yeah, that's what holiness is, I guess, you know, and just can't really touch that, can't really, you know, it's kind of there and, and it's nice, right? Um, in fact, holy is often a reason people avoid church. They feel disconnected from it. They feel unholy and unworthy. Or, or, you know, uh, or they don't want to be beat with a Bible by a bunch of holy rollers, right? With a holier-than-thou attitude. I mean, who wants that? I know I don't, okay? That's one of the, the, my least favorite things about a lot of churches and so forth. But it's my hope today uh, to help us understand the word holy as it applies to God and then how it may apply to each of our lives. And if you're a Christ follower, this will mean a lot to you. If you're a spiritually curious person, I hope this will clarify some things in your mind about God and about what it means to him or for him to be holy. And so in your uh, handouts, you have a green sheet in there that uh, you can pull out if you want to take notes and, and uh, follow along. You can do that. You can try to figure out ahead of time what the next word is going to be. You know, some people like to, you know, they get bored and they do that. So anyway, feel free, whatever you want to do. Uh, let's look at the holiness of God, okay? And today we're going to go a little bit deeper than we normally do on a Sunday morning, and I, uh, I hope you're okay with that. Some of you will love me for it. Others of you will hate me for it, and you can tell me later later, but uh, just not today. Uh, anyway, but as we begin looking at the holiness of God and what that means, I just want to say that, you know, I really shouldn't even be speaking on this topic because I am so far from holy. Uh, there was, there's such conviction in um, when I was preparing this, the, the talk for this morning, uh, and, 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 and God's holiness, you know, is so incredibly uh, beyond where I'm at today, beyond anything either, either of us have ever seen or experienced. But, but even so, you know, it's something that we all do need to understand a little bit more. Um, and so we're going to look at three components of what it means uh, that God is holy, and so that we can grasp a clearer understanding of the ter term and how it describes who God is. And then we'll, we'll look at what does that mean for us today. So um, the first the point there is, is holy describes God's absolute uniqueness, okay? That, that's, that's what it describes. God's holiness is that which divides him from everyone and everything else. It's the quality of the awesome mystery in God's being, his essential nature and character that make him different, that make him distinct, that make him unique from any other thing or person in the universe. The, the dictionary offers the definitions, uh, definitions like this, like to divide or to set apart from all else. And so holy is the opposite of profane, it's the opposite of common, it's the opposite of ordinary. And to be holy is to be distinct. It's to be different. It's to be unique. And this uniqueness is equated with high, infinite value. All right? And so, so this is part of that definition of holy. You hear something that Moses said in, in uh, the book of Exodus. He said this, Are there any gods like you, Lord? 
There are no gods like you. You are wonderfully holy, amazingly powerful, a worker of miracles. He's saying, you know what, there is nothing. There is no one who is like God. He is, absolute unique. He is absolutely unique. And that is so clear in Scripture. Absolutely clear in Scripture. And this aspect of his holiness is reflected through creation. Notice that when God created, he didn't create everything the same. He didn't create a clone army like the emperor did in Star Wars, okay? Or like a bunch of stormtroopers or something like that. He didn't create anything like that. He didn't create cloned planets or, or solar systems. He didn't manufacture robots on an assembly line. And he didn't just create a single cell that would just eventually, you know, uh, evolve into the life forms we see today. Instead, he created such a wide variety of everything. A wide variety of plants, trees, animals, sea creatures, bugs, and yes, even spiders. Probably just to get a good laugh out of people like me, okay? Hey, let's dangle this little bad boy in front of him and see what he does, right? Okay, and oh, that's what I do and it makes God laugh, I think. But anyway, um, but even within each species of creation, even with each, in each subspecies, there is uniqueness, no two of anything are exactly alike. No two cats or dogs or field mice or trout are exactly alike. No two people are exactly alike. In, in, in fact, even our fingerprints, right, give us uniqueness. Now they have eye scanners because everyone is different. There's uniqueness in that. Every snowflake that falls in the wintertime is different. And we see this uniqueness and the uniqueness of creation and how even the smallest detail of everything stands apart. And what it does is it reflects this aspect of the holiness of God. Except that there is none that compares to him, of course, in his power and purity and greatness and majesty and intellect and love and compassion and mercy and goodness. God is set apart and absolutely unique, which partly defines his holiness. What else? Holy describes God's moral purity, which is normally what we think of a lot of times when it comes to holiness. Okay? In God's uniqueness, in his infinite difference, God is purely love, purely moral, and purely and completely without sin. There is no corruption in him, in his character. There is no depravity, no lust, no impurity. God's holiness includes the absolute absence of evil within his character. None whatsoever. A few, a few weeks ago, we looked at the attribute of God uh, called his goodness, that God is good, and because he is good by nature, he is holy. And there is no evil within him. There is no impurity. He is absolutely perfect. And some of you here today may need to hear this because deep down inside, you fear that God may in some way have evil intentions toward you. And the truth is that he doesn't. In fact, it's just the opposite. His intentions and his thoughts toward you and about you flow from his moral purity. Okay? Something that we need to grasp today. God is holy. He's sinless, void of evil, evil absolutely pure. Um, A.W. Tozer, who he's one of those deep-thinking guys, and, and he wrote a number of books. Uh, he's, he's no longer around. But one of the books he wrote is called Knowledge of the Holy. And, and it's one of those books where you just got to really digest slowly because it's like power-packed with, like, I really got to reflect on this kind of a thing. And, but I'm going to read a, a portion of what we talked about in, in terms of his holiness. He said this. It'll be on the screen. And you can follow along. Just in case my voice gets a little boring, you can like imagine he's talking. So anyway, uh, God is holy, and he has made holiness the moral condition necessary to the health of his universe. Sin's temporary existence in the world only accents this. Whatever is holy is healthy. Evil is a moral sickness that must ultimate, end ultimately in death. And then he went on, he said this, Since God's first concern for his universe is its moral health, that is, its holiness, whatever is contrary to that is necessarily under his eternal displeasure. To preserve his creation, God must destroy whatever would destroy it. When he arises to put down iniquity and save the world from irreparable moral collapse, he is said to be angry. 
Every wrathful judgment in the history of the world has been a holy act of preservation. The holiness of God, the wrath of God, and the health of the creation are inseparably united. God's wrath is his, utterance, is his utter intolerance of whatever degrades and destroys. He hates iniquity as a mother hates the polio that takes the life of her child. Okay, Kind of deep there. Kind of powerful. You see how it's all, you know, I love how he, he connects God's moral purity, not, not only with his actions, but also with the health and wholeness of all creation. In fact, holy is derived from the word whole. Not like whole, like there's a hole in my pants, but whole, like whole, like a whole donut, okay? I guess. Anyway, uh, so the next point is holy describes God's completeness, all right? His completeness. God's holiness refers you know, also his wholeness, his completeness. One other way that God is set apart from us in creation, another aspect of his uniqueness is that God lacks nothing. Okay? And this is something that we, by and large, can't relate to very well. And if we can, it's only on a temporary basis. God doesn't need to eat or drink or even sleep. He doesn't need a nap like my kids do. He doesn't need vitamins to keep him healthy like we do. And he doesn't need medication either. God's not on meds, okay, in case you were wondering. But he doesn't need money to spend or a car to drive or a house to live in. He doesn't need a spouse to complete him, okay? You know, uh, he doesn't need a, a drink, a puff, or a chew. He doesn't even need football to entertain him. I, don't know, I can't relate to that, okay? Um, now, just because he doesn't need football doesn't mean he doesn't like football, right? Okay, all right. But God is complete and God is whole, and he is self-fulfilled, whereas you and I, we aren't. We're incomplete, every one of us, in so many ways, physically and spiritually and emotionally. It's why we're constantly hungry for something, whether it's food or fame or fortune or something to fill the pain or hungry to, to get out of this service because it's just boring, whatever it is, okay? I mean, we, we're hungry for something. We're incomplete. Uh, Jack Hayford said this. He said, worshiping the holiness of God is not just about his greatness and absence of sin, but it's a recognition of his completeness versus our incompleteness, is what he said. And so within God's holiness lies the answer to our incompleteness and our need to be healed or made whole. And the reason we're even looking at this goes back to something else that Tozer said, something that we looked at a few weeks ago, where he said this, it'll be on the screen, he said, what comes to our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And that was the Sunday that, that we talked about perceptions, the one that, that I had, I was on pain meds, okay? Um, so, yeah, that was fun. Um, but perception and vision are everything. And whether or not we somehow see God's holiness it matters to the highest degree in our lives. We need to see it. Um, so we're going to take another look at a life-changing experience of a guy named, named Isaiah and what he saw and how he, it deeply affected his life. Now, we read this passage a few weeks ago. We're going to read it again, okay, because it's good to get a refresher. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Okay, he says, I saw him. Okay, my eyes, seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And, with, and they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, Almighty, or is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. I mean, picture what he must have experienced. Back, back uh, in 2006, when um, my kids were younger, and... Uh, Brielle had just been born, and, and, and Calissa was three years old. Michael was six. We thought, let's take him to a movie. All right. And so we decided uh, Night at muse the Museum would be a good one. And, uh, and so we took them. Okay, Brielle, you know, she was not aware of anything because she was just born. And so we took them, um, and they were enjoying the movie. 
up until the dinosaur bones came to life. And uh, Michael was shaking and covering his eyes. Calissa was crying and trying to exit the theater. You know, big lesson learned, okay? They were just a little bit overwhelmed with what they saw on the big screen. Now imagine, though, what Isaiah experienced, because that was nothing. This vision and encounter that Isaiah had, what Isaiah saw, shook him to the core of his being. For the first time in his life, he not only sees God in all his beauty and all his majesty and sovereignty, but he also sees himself in the light of the holiness of God. And he reacts to what he sees for the first time, his his own frailty and impurity and, and utter unworthiness before holy God. And so here's what happened next. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice, the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Here am I. Send me. See, what Isaiah saw rocked his world. And completely changed his life. And so like Isaiah, this next point is, we need to see God's holiness. We need to see his holiness. Um, uh, Why, this next point here is, uh, we're too comfortable with unholiness. We are way too comfortable. When Isaiah realizes what he's witnessing before his very eyes, he realizes not only his own sin, but also the unholy environment in which he has grown comfortable with. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king. And like Isaiah, our lives are surrounded with unholiness. Would you agree? I mean, totally and completely. It doesn't matter who you are or what you believe. We live in a culture that is so incredibly unholy. And most, if not all of us, have grown comfortable with at least part of it if not all of it, we've become desensitized. And I, when I say we, I mean me too, all right? I'm not just saying, oh, you, okay? It's we have. In fact, in our culture, there isn't too much left that is not accepted or condoned, whether it's sexual immorality of all kinds or murder of the unborn from power-hungry politicians who lie and manipulate and it's like it's going out of style to our own justification of greed and love of money, from filthy thoughts to uncontrolled anger and abuse. There's sickness, addictions, dysfunctions, and incompleteness all around us. More and more, all these things are considered normal, or at least treatable. Here, just get a prescription, right? I mean, that's, it's, it's what it is. And as long as, you know, things don't get too far out of hand and threaten our comfortable lives, we live with the unholiness around us. And we allow it to become part of who we are. We allow the world to conform us into its common, ordinary, and profane image. Just like Abraham's uh, Abraham's cousin, Lot, who chose to live in Sodom. He became comfortable with his surroundings, so much so that he couldn't see the sin in his own life, so much so that, that when angels came to visit him and the people of the, the town wanted to come and have sex with the angels, he threw his daughters out there instead. Okay, Talk about a creep. Talk about letting the unholiness around him affect his morality and who he is. Okay, um, but our comfort, and this is, this is why we need to encounter God's holiness, so we can see things as they really are. Our comfort with the unholiness around us is why so many churched people actually avoid seeking God and knowing him. Spending time with God threatens our comfort level. You know, I'm not singling anyone out. It's true in my own life. But we find, you know, churched people Um, even twisting scripture to justify their own actions and thoughts and unholiness. And and, uh, Jude speaks to this. He said this. It's on the screen. He said, For certain men have secretly slipped in among you. In other words, you really can't tell they're there because you're comfortable with it. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into a license for immorality. 
And so he, he, he talks about a, a twisting of, 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 of teaching, a twisting of doctrine, a twisting of truth. Yes, there's grace, but then they twist it into, well, yeah, you can go ahead and just do everything, anything you want. You know, and so we Christians, you know, we have our pet sins that we like to hold on to. You know, maybe it's that unforgiveness or lust or faithless attitudes or, or power trips or greed or malice or unkind thoughts. You know, pet sins that we don't think um, uh, are that big of a deal. But this isn't just about sin either. It's also about incompleteness, unhealthy patterns and thoughts and dysfunctions things that can be painful to acknowledge. You know, we don't, we don't want to see that we're codependent. We don't want to see that we're irresponsible. We don't want to see that we have unhealed wounds or addictive behaviors. We don't want to see that we have control issues or, or bad attitudes or critical attitudes or that we're prideful or arrogant or full of ourselves. You know, I remember reading this one story about this missionary traveling through uh, South America, uh, the jungles of South America. And he had been traveling for some time and ran out of food. And so he kept traveling, and after three days without food, he collapsed there in the middle of the jungle and fell asleep. And uh, while he was sleeping, he began to dream of butterflies fluttering around him, okay? And he dreamt, you know, suddenly in his dream, a butterfly flew into his mouth, and he could feel its wings tickling the roof of his mouth. And it was so real that he began to wake up. And as he woke, he could feel, still feel the wings flapping in his mouth. And so he reached into his mouth and began to pull out a six-foot-long tapeworm that had unknowingly been residing in his stomach, all right? The tapeworm was so hungry that it came up through its, his throat in search of food, all right? I mean, this, this was like, like how bad it was. And I mean, and... Uh, <laughs> But the question is, how many tapeworms have we become comfortable with in our own lives that reside within us? Parasites of the environment that have become part of us. You know, Isaiah saw clearly his needy state after clearly seeing God in his holiness. And this is why we need a glimpse of God's holiness. Totally why. Can you get off the uh, tapeworm? Some of you can't. <laughs> You're done. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's move. Uh, true story, okay? But, um, but what an example of, of how, you know, we don't know something's living there. And Anyway. Next. Vision changes perspective and affects direction. Um, and, and, you know, th- think about it. Uh, nothing impairs my ability to drive anywhere more than my ability to see. Okay? Um, if it's clear outside and I can see accurately, my foot tends to get a little heavier. Okay, I don't know if it happens with you, but it happens with me. Funny how that works. And he's driving my kids to San Francisco. <laughs> All right, anyway. Um, but, you know, if, if I can see obstacles ahead, like a cat crossing the road or, or one of the many red lights here in Boise or one of the many slow drivers here in Boise as well, um, you know, I can adjust my speed. I can change directions. I can zip around it. If it's clear outside, I can see if I'm going in the wrong direction. But if it's dark or foggy or I fall asleep at the wheel, it's going to be a lot harder to correct my error, Right? Vision changes perspective and direction. You know, we are so affected by what we see. And think about even the simple times you've seen something in nature that just took your breath away. You know, I've seen uh, the sunrise over mountain peaks, blue skies over, um, over mountain lakes, glassy lakes. I've been captivated by the beauty of a sunset on the beach and the stunning view of the sun setting on African plains, okay? It's... it's, it's You've, you've been there, right? I mean, not Africa, but I mean, you've been to places like that where you're just like, oh, oh my goodness, I just got to sit here, you know? And, and when you see something like that, you're affected by it. You, you're moved to just gaze. You're moved to just stare, you know? You want another look to soak it in. And in many cases, a desire to worship wells up within you, and you just can't get enough of what you're seeing. Have you ever experienced something like that? Anyone? Yeah, some of us have. You know, it's the way I feel whenever I eat coffee bean blast ice cream from Trader Joe's. I just got to have more, you know, just this, you know, sense of awe, you know. Um, but, but there was a, another guy in Scripture who had a similar experience. 
as Isaiah, where he found himself in heaven and saw God on his throne. It was John the Apostle. And he wrote about his experience in the book of Revelation. And he describes the absolute stunning beauty of the environment. Like nothing he had ever seen before. Music and worship that filled his senses. Angels and people and God himself there. And one of the things that he describes is pretty interesting. There are these four living creatures, as he calls them. Four incredibly powerful beings, the likes of which he had never seen before. They were all covered with eyes, he describes. I think that's a little creepy, but anyway. Um, And these beings were the closest in proximity to God's throne. And John says that day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And I remember times in the past reading that. And when I thought, well, that's a boring way to live. To be those day, night, nonstop, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty, right? I think, wow, that's kind of boring. What a bummer of a job those guys have. I mean, you know, uh, boy, you know, are they missing out on life. Uh, like like, like that, that one song that came out about 10 years ago, um, I could sing of your love forever, right? You know, and I, you know, and that song came out, I was thinking, yeah, okay, I could probably sing of God's love forever. I can't sing this song forever, more than five minutes, actually. But anyway, um, you know, and so, so with these living creatures, you know, I wondered if, if, if God had just made some strange-looking wind-up toys or robots to worship him. All right, what's the deal with that? But it's not like that at all. You see, like in the case of a breathtaking view from the top of the mountain or, or maybe the way your bride looks on her wedding day, vision often inspires worship. And those four living creatures were so enamored and so entirely captivated by the beauty and majesty and holiness of God that all of their eyes were seen, that they couldn't help but respond. In such a way. And they never stopped, as John said. Why? Because God is infinite. And every time they would bow to worship, they would rise up and they would see something new that they had never seen before about God. And they're struck with awe and struck with that sense of, oh, holy, holy, holy is God almighty. And so they bow down and they come up again and they see something they've never seen before. Does that make sense about why he even says that and how vision, vision changes perspectives and affects direction? You know, um, it's powerful. But what does it mean for us to see God, Mike? You know, you're not making any sense. Uh, For John, for Isaiah, it was a real conscious experience where they visually saw God in all his glory. Uh, These two were taken somehow to the throne room of God in heaven. Not many people are granted that kind of privilege uh, and experience in this life. For most other people, seeing God refers to some kind of encounter with God and his presence here on earth, where there's a, a, a very heightened awareness of him and who he is accurately, and we catch a glimpse of his holiness. There's an understanding of God that penetrates our mind and penetrates our heart. And the result of that is where life change comes. To encounter God like that often requires, though, seeking God. Going after him, pursuing, saying, I gotta know. I gotta know God. And I can guarantee you that Isaiah was a person who sought after God. And the result of seeking God, the result of his vision changed his perspective of everything. It affected the direction that he took in his life. Isaiah not only served God, but he became a humble yet powerful spokesperson for him. One cannot truly see God in his splendor and holiness and the next instant exalt himself. See, seeing God changes you for the better. God wants us to see him and encounter him because, this next point here, and we're almost done. God desires to share his holiness with us. Just like there are things about me, whether my, there are qualities that I have or experiences that I've enjoyed or things I like to do that I want to share with my kids because I love them, 
Whether it's a love for God I want to share with them or the exhilaration of skiing down a mountain uh, that I want to share with them or the joy of cheering for such a great team like the 49ers. You know, uh, I, you know there are things about me that I want to share with my kids, right? Sometimes sharing involves doing other, uh, things together and other times it involves training and discipline. Something that uh, the writer of Hebrews said, he said, God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. See, there are qualities of his, ho- of his holiness, his uniqueness and his moral purity and completeness that God, because he is good, wants to share with us, that he wants us to experience. He goes, I've got it so good, you guys. Let me share this with you, if you're willing. Okay? That which sets God apart from all else, all else he wants us to experience. It's why Peter said on the screen, he said, But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. This is something that God speaks to us. So what does that mean? What does it mean to be holy? Okay? Just like, his, just like the three things that Describe God's holiness. Same thing with us. God wants us to stand out. And this goes back to uniqueness, the uniqueness of God that God created in each one of us. You know, I finally saw that movie Divergent. Have you guys seen that movie? Phenomenal movie. Oh, you guys got to see it. It's in the dollar theater, $3 theater, whatever you want to call it. Okay? It's there. You guys got to see it. It was, it was just great. Incredible movie. I absolutely loved it. And in this movie, society had divided people into five different categories. I went like this, but it's like this, okay? Five different categories, mostly because, um, or mostly based on a kind of like a personality test. And so if you were smart, you're a erudite. If, if, um, if you were adventurous, you'd join the dauntless. If you were humble and served people, you were part of the abnegation group and so forth. There are two other groups, I can't remember their names. But um, there were certain people who didn't fit into those categories, and they were called divergent, unique. And they were considered a threat to those who were in power because they thought outside the box and they didn't fit all of society. You know, and the world today isn't much different in a lot of ways. It seeks to conform us to its image. We're tempted to be like everyone else, to talk like everyone else, to pursue what society says we should pursue, to think like society says we should think, to value what uh, it says we should value, to live like it says we should live. Don't diverge from the system, people. Don't rock the boat is what's communicated to us, and we so often fall prey to that. We live that, you know, and when we live that way, we suppress the uniqueness that God purposely designed in us. We hide what what we were never meant to hide. The light that we were supposed to shine, we cover it with a bowl, you know. You don't have to cheer for the Seahawks just because your friends tell you to, okay? I'll tell you that, all right. Um, but, you know, when, when Paul, in, in, in the book of Romans, talked about not conforming to the patterns of this world, okay, it's interesting that just three sentences later, he started talking about living according to the unique design and gifts that God has created in each one of us. If you've got a gift of teaching, then teach, if you've got a gift of serving, then, insert, then serve. If it's encouraging, then encourage. If it's giving, then give. If it's leading, then lead. If it's being merciful, then being, be, be merciful. If it's speaking for God, then speak for God. Okay? I, I'm just bummed that he didn't list eating as a gift because I'm good at that. Okay? But anyway, in other words, finding out how God has uniquely designed you and live that out for the good of those around you. Okay, this is part of what it means to be holy. Live as God designed you to live. Live as he's created you to live. Find out those gifts and those strengths that he is, you know, uh, I, I shared this with some of you before. I took that Strengths Finder uh, 2.0. I, you know, I, I read the, the, the book and took the test. And, and, and as, as a leader, there are certain qualities of the 34 that I really wanted to be true of me, like maximizer or achiever or something like sounding powerful, right? And I didn't get those. My top five, I, 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 got, I got communicator, okay, all right, I could see that. I got positivity, okay, yeah, all right, I, you know, I'm usually pretty positive. Um, you know, I, I got uh, belief, in other words, like, you know, live by your convictions, okay, that's true. But my top one was includer. I'm like, what kind of a loser? Strength is that? 
And I was, I was, I mean, seriously, I was depressed for two weeks, thinking my top one is Includer. What the heck? You know? And, and I'm just, just struggling with God. Come on! You know? And, uh, and it was in that time that, that God began to speak to me and said, Mike, I designed that way, you that way for a purpose, and, and you're going to see how I'm going to touch lives through that gift. And so chill out and stop being a wimp, you know. And, uh, and you know, and so I did embrace it, and all right, I want to go stronger in it. But, but does that make sense? He wants us to stand out by how he designed us. That's part of sharing his holiness. The second one is God wants us to be morally pure. We are seriously almost done. I know you've heard that before. Um, and, and, and this is another part of what it means for us to be holy is, is to share in God's holiness and his moral purity. Now, I know that we've all made mistakes, and we still do, and we're tempted every day. But the bottom line is that sin never ends well. It just doesn't. And we all know this. Moral purity, however, is good. It's good for us. It's good for others. And, you know, to be like God, it's tough. But it's, life is so much better. So much better. You know, you don't have to deal with the guilt or the shame or the hiding or the manipulating or the negative consequences of living immorally. But living morally, you know, it, it doesn't mean that you conform yourself to some set of legalistic standards that religious people tell you. Yeah, I remember a time when a lot of churches considered things like bullying, big owls, a sin, right? They, they, uh, going to movies was a sin. Playing cards was a sin. Even looking at a glass of wine, you know, I didn't drink it. Okay, I mean, there were times when it, 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 it was all considered a sin. When I told you before, it, while back when I went to Bible college, okay, I mean, it, there's dancing was almost on the same level as killing your mom, right? Uh, there's that, there was that saying that went around. Why doesn't Bethany, our Bible college, allow us to have premarital sex? Because it might lead to dancing, okay? And that was what it was, you know, I mean, that legalism that was just like forced down your throat, okay? This is not what I'm talking about. Moral purity is going to Scripture and to find out what pleases God, you know, what, what God considers to be moral and pure, and then to seek to live that way. You know, it's not easy, but it's good, and God desires that for us because he is good. You following that? Okay? It's not about legalism, but it is about relationship, and it is about acknowledging and saying, God, I want that piece of you because I understand that it's better for me. I understand it's better for everyone else, and I understand that pleases you, and I want to please you, God. And, and okay, next, last, or second to last, God wants us whole, like he is. He sees our incompleteness. He sees our hurts and pains. He sees the wounds. He desires us to be healed, whether that's a direct healing from him or, or, or that we pursue healing in our lives. He wants us healthy in every sense of the word, okay, physically, spiritually, um, mentally, Emotionally, there are so many emotionally unhealthy people in this world, and we all know them, okay, because we are them. Angry people, dis depressed people, insecure people, reactionary people, controlling people, critical people, obsessive people, addicted people, you name it. And, and, and God says, don't stay that way. Seek me, seek my wholeness for your life. Share in who I am, share in my holiness. And this last point is, you see, the whole thing, it's about transformation for us. It's, it's not about doing, but about becoming. It's transforming. It's allowing God to transform us from the inside out, to transform us, you know, uh, with the, the, the living coals that, that for example, that, that Isaiah saw, they took from the altar, okay? And there's a difference between doing and being. A dog can be trained to do certain human-type things, like shake hands and roll over and sit up and beg and even use the toilet, all right? Crazy stuff, okay? But there are certain human things that a dog will never be able to do because it is not, or it be not, a human, okay? It will never be able to speak English or brush his own teeth or play guitar or use a computer, None of that. And because it is a dog, or because it be a dog, okay, and not human, there are things that it will always do. It will always wag its tail and bark and pee on trees and lick someone else's vomit, okay? I've seen that happen, all right? They're, they're attracted, you know, but they do this because it is a dog or it be a dog. 
And that's why God's instructions aren't do holy things. It's be holy. Be transformed. Become like me. Be unique. Be moral. Be whole. Because God is good and it starts with seeing his holiness. Let's stand. And we're going to pray. When Paul said in Romans to not be conformed to the image or the patterns of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is all part of it. So God, thank you that you are so incredibly gracious. And we acknowledge today that you are holy. And we come before you, God, and we ask that you would help us to even just catch a glimpse of the holiness of who you are. We're not worthy to look on, upon you. But God, your son, Jesus Christ, makes us worthy. And so help us to see your holiness. Help us to catch a glimpse of who you are. And may we be changed by that. May we be willing to share in your holiness. To live lives that stand out as you designed us to stand out. To let go of immoral behavior and thoughts and actions that have become part of us like, like a tapeworm. And to instead change the way we think and allow you to transform who we are. Would you heal us, God, from wounds and from dysfunctions and, and the incompleteness that we find in our lives? May we desire to be holy and may we see you and know you as the Holy One.